What causes inflation? Inflation is a measure of how fast prices of goods and services are rising. If inflation is occurring leading to higher prices for basic necessities, such as food, it can have a negative impact on the overall economy. Inflation can occur in nearly any product or service, including need-based expenses such as housing, food, medical care, and utilities, as well as want expenses, such as cosmetics, automobiles, and jewelry. Once inflation becomes prevalent throughout an economy, the expectation of further inflation becomes an overriding concern in the consciousness of consumers and businesses alike. Central banks of developed economies, including the Federal Reserve in the U.S., monitor inflation. The Fed has an inflation target of approximately 2 and adjusts monetary policy to combat inflation if prices rise too much or too quickly. 1. Inflation can be a concern because it makes money saved today less valuable tomorrow. Inflation erodes a consumer's purchasing power and can even interfere with the ability to retire. For example, if an investor earned fives from investments in stocks and bonds, but the inflation rate was three, the investor only earned two in real terms. In this article, we'll examine the fundamental factors behind inflation, different types of inflation, interprint types of inflation, and who benefits from it. Key takeaways. Inflation is a measure of the rate of rising prices of goods and services in an economy. Inflation can occur when prices rise due to increases in production costs, such as raw materials and wages. A surge in demand for products and services can cause inflation as consumers are willing to pay more for the product. Some companies reap the rewards of inflation if they can charge more for their products as a result of the high demand for their goods. What drives inflation? There are various factors that can drive prices or inflation in an economy. Typically, inflation results from an increase in production costs or an increase in demand for products and services. Cost. Push inflation. Cost. Push inflation occurs when prices rise because production costs increase, such as raw materials and wages. The demand for goods is unchanged while the supply of goods declines due to the higher costs of production. As a result, the added costs of production are passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices for the finished goods. One of the signs of possible cost. Push inflation can be seen in rising commodity prices such as oil and metals since they're major production inputs. For example, if the price of copper rises, companies that use copper to make their products might increase the prices of their goods. If the demand for the product is independent of the demand for copper, the business will pass on the higher costs of raw materials to consumers. The result is higher prices for consumers without any change in demand for the products consumed. Wages also affect the cost of production and are typically the single biggest expense for businesses. When the economy is performing well and the unemployment rate is low, shortages in labor or workers can occur. Companies, in turn, increase wages to attract qualified candidates, causing production costs to rise for the company. If the company raises prices due to the rise in employee wages, cost plus inflation occurs. Natural disasters can also drive prices higher. For example, if a hurricane destroys a crop such as corn, prices can rise across the economy since corn is used in many products. Demand. Pull inflation. Demand. Pull inflation can be caused by strong consumer demand for a product or service. When there's a surge in demand for a wide breadth of goods across an economy, their prices tend to increase. While this is not often a concern for short-term imbalances of supply and demand, Sustained demand can reverberate in the economy and raise costs for other goods. The result is demand pull inflation. Consumer confidence tends to be high when unemployment is low and wages are rising, leading to more spending. Economic expansion has a direct impact on the level of consumer spending in an economy, which can lead to high demand for products and services. As the demand for a particular good or service increases, the available supply decreases. When fewer items are available, consumers are willing to pay more to obtain the item, as outlined in the economic principle of supply and demand. The result is higher prices due to demand. Pull inflation. Companies also play a role in inflation, especially if they manufacture popular products. A company can raise prices simply because consumers are willing to pay the increased amount. Corporations also raise prices freely when the item for sale is something consumers need for everyday existence such as oil and gas. However, it's the demand from consumers that provide corporations with the leverage to raise prices. Built in inflation and rising wages. Built 
In inflation occurs when enough people expect inflation to continue in the future. As the price of goods and services rises, people may come to believe in a continuous rise in the future at a similar rate. Because of these shared expectations, workers may start to demand higher wages in order to anticipate rising prices and maintain their standard of living. Increased wages would result in higher costs for businesses, which may pass those costs on to consumers. Higher wages also increase consumers' disposable income, increasing the demand for goods that can push prices even higher. A wage. Price spiral can then be set in place as one factor feeds back into the other and vice. Versa. The housing market. The housing market, for example, has seen its ups and downs over the years. If homes are in demand because the economy is experiencing an expansion, home prices will rise. The demand also impacts ancillary products and services that support the housing industry. Construction products such as lumber and steel, as well as the nails and rivets used in homes, might all see increases in demand resulting from higher demand for homes. Expansionary Fiscal and Monetary Policy Expansionary fiscal policy by governments can increase the amount of discretionary income for both businesses and consumers. If a government cuts taxes, businesses may spend it on capital improvements, employee compensation, or new hiring. Consumers may purchase more goods as well. The government could also stimulate the economy by increasing spending on infrastructure projects. The result could be an increase in demand for goods and services leading to price increases. Just as expansionary fiscal policy can spur inflation, so too can loose monetary policy. Expansionary monetary policy by central banks can lower interest rates. Central banks like the Federal Reserve can lower the cost for banks to lend, which allows banks to lend more money to businesses and consumers. The increase in money available throughout the economy leads to more spending and demand for goods and services. Monetary devaluation Monetarists understand inflation to be caused by too many dollars chasing too few goods. In other words, the supply of money has grown too large. According to this theory, money's value is subject to the law of supply and demand, just like any other good in the market. As the supply grows, the value goes down. If the value of money goes down, its purchasing power drops and things become relatively more expensive. This quantity theory of money, KTIM, can be summarized in the equation of exchange which states that the money supply multiplied by the rate at which money is spent per year, the velocity of money, equals the nominal expenditures in the economy. MVA, typical. EP prices can thus go up as the money supply increases and you the velocity of money increases, given a constant quantity of goods in the economy. Money can also lose value due to a general lack of confidence or trust in the issuer of the money. In this case, hyperinflation may even set it as the money is seen as lacking value altogether. Measures of Inflation Consumer Price Index, key P. There are a few metrics that are used to measure the inflation rate. One of the most popular is the Consumer Price Index, PE Pi, which measures prices for a basket of goods and services in the economy, including food, cars, education, and recreation. Changes in the prices of this basket, therefore, Approximate changes in prices across the whole economy. The CPI is often the economic indicator of choice used for measuring inflation. While the CPI does measure the price changes for retail goods and other items paid by consumers, it does not include things like savings and investments and will often exclude spending by foreign visitors. In April 2022, the Consumer Price Index increased 0.3 on a seasonally adjusted basis. But when compared to the year prior, the full index increased 10.18, making it the largest year-over-year -year increase since November 1980. 2. 3. Producer Price Index, P. Another measure of inflation is the Producer Price Index, PEE, which reports the price changes that affect domestic producers. The PI measures prices for fuel, farm products, meats and grains, chemical products, and metals. If the price increases that cause the pie to spike get passed on to consumers, it will be reflected in the consumer price index. Pie measures inflation from the viewpoint of the producers, the average selling price they receive for their output over a period of time. Meanwhile, CPI measures prices from the standpoint of the consumer. GDP deflator. The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, BIA, uses the gross domestic product, GDPU, deflator, also known as the DD price deflator, as an additional indicator of the level of U.S. inflation. 
The GDP deflator measures the aggregate prices of all goods and services produced by the entire nation. It encompasses both the CPI and PI statistics. Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index The Personal Consumption Expenditures PEC, index is another measure of inflation that tracks price changes in the amount spent on consumer goods and services exchanged in the U.S. Economy the PC price index is composed of a broad range of expenditures that is far larger than the basket of goods used in the CPI, and it is weighted by data provided by regular business surveys, which tend to be more reliable than the consumer surveys used by the CPI. In 2012, the PC price index became the primary inflation index used by the U.S. Federal Reserve when making monetary policy decisions. 4. How to protect against inflation High inflation is generally a negative, hurting both consumers and businesses. There are, however, some ways to protect against inflation. Lock in low fixed interest rates. A 30-year mortgage at a low fixed interest rate is protected against inflation. Look to borrow when interest rates are low and consider refinancing when rates drop. Invest in stocks. Stock markets tend to do relatively better than bonds in a high inflation environment, as many companies end up passing on higher costs to consumers, which protects profits. Firms that produce commodities or staple goods are often good bets. Bonds, on the other hand, see their prices go down as interest rates rise along with inflation. Buy inflation. Protected securities. Some financial products are linked to inflation, often via changes in CPI, such as treasury inflation protected securities, or TIPS, which adjust in price to offset inflation. Some permanent life insurance products and annuities may also have an option to be adjusted for inflation, often in the form of a cost of living adjustment, COLA, Rider, save at high interest rates. Use high interest rates to save money in money market accounts or CDs at more favorable yields. Note, however, that if the yield proves to be lower than the rate of inflation, you'll still lose buying power. Buy an inflation hedge. Certain assets like gold and real estate are thought to be good hedges against inflation, increasing in value along with a general rise in prices. Own rental real estate. When inflation hits, landlords can often raise the rent to keep pace. If you have an income property with a fixed rate mortgage, this can greatly improve your bottom line. What causes inflation? Economists have identified several possible causes for inflation. Cost, Push inflation is the decrease in the aggregate supply of goods and services stemming from an increase in the cost of production. An increase in the costs of raw materials or labor can contribute to demand. Pull inflation. Expectations of inflation that prompt higher wages leading to higher costs are theorized as built in inflation. Supply or demand shocks can also cause higher prices, as can loose fiscal and monetary policy. Who benefits from inflation? In general, inflation benefits borrowers who have lower fixed interest rates and owners of assets that rise along with inflation. The relative costs of servicing these debts becomes less expensive with inflation. Investors can enjoy a boost if they hold assets in markets affected by inflation. For example, those who are invested in energy companies might see a rise in their stock prices if energy prices are rising. Often, value stocks perform better than growth stocks during inflationary periods. Five who is hurt by inflation. Inflation tends to harm savers and lenders the most. Savers see their cash deposits eroded of purchasing power, while those who loaned money at lower fixed interest rates are stuck with less valuable loans until they mature. Consumers are also harmed by inflation as goods become more expensive. Lower income consumers can be hurt the most, as these people tend to spend a higher proportion of their income overall and on necessities than those with higher incomes and so have less of a cushion against the loss of purchasing power inherent in inflation. Can companies benefit from inflation? Some companies reap the rewards of inflation if they can charge more for their products as a result of a surge in demand for their goods. If the economy is performing well and housing demand is high, home building companies can charge higher prices for selling homes. In other words, inflation can provide businesses with pricing power and increase their profit margins. If profit margins are rising, it means the prices that companies charge for their products are increasing at a faster rate than increases in production costs. Also, business owners can deliberately withhold supplies from the market, allowing prices to rise to a favorable level. However, companies can also be hurt by inflation if it's the result of a surge in production costs.
Companies are at risk if they're unable to pass on the higher costs to consumers through higher prices. If foreign competition, for example, is unaffected by the production cost increases, their prices wouldn't need to rise. As a result, U.S. companies might have to eat the higher production costs, otherwise risk losing customers to foreign-based companies. The bottom line. Inflation occurs when prices rise in an economy and or the purchasing power of money loses value. Economists have identified several possible causes for inflation from rising wages to increased aggregate demand to an increase in the supply of money. In 2022, inflation rates in the U.S. and around the world rose to their highest levels since the early 1980s. While there is no single reason for this rapid rise in global prices, a series of events work together to boost inflation in its latest cycle, including the repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, and the shock to energy and food prices that resulted. Understand the different types of inflation. At its most basic level, inflation is a general increase in prices across the economy and is well known to all of us. After all, who among us has not reminisced about cheap rents of the past or how little lunch used to cost? And who has not noticed prices on everything from milk to movie tickets creeping upward? In this article, we explore the major types of inflation and touch upon the competing explanations offered by different economic schools. Key Takeaways Inflation is the rate at which the overall level of prices for various goods and services in an economy rises over a period of time. As a result, money loses value because it no longer buys as much as it did in previous times. The purchasing power of a country's currency declines. Central banks look to maintain mild inflation of as much as three to help spur economic growth. But inflation considerably beyond that level could lead to brutal situations such as hyperinflation or stagflation. Hyperinflation is a period of fast-rising inflation. Stagflation is a period of spiking inflation plus slow economic growth and high unemployment. Deflation is when prices drop significantly due to too large a money supply or a slump in consumer spending. Lower costs mean companies earn less and may institute layoffs. Stagflation and hyperinflation, two extremes. Although as consumers, we may hate rising prices, many economists believe a moderate degree of inflation is healthy for a nation's economy. Typically, central banks aim to maintain inflation around two to three. One, increases in inflation significantly beyond this range can lead to fears of possible hyperinflation a devastating scenario in which inflation rises rapidly out of control. There have been several notable instances of hyperinflation throughout history. The most famous example is Germany during the early 1920s when inflation reached 30,000 per month. Zimbabwe offers an even more extreme example. According to research by Steve H. Hankey and Alex K. F. Quaid Ewok, Monthly price increases in Zimbabwe reached an estimated 79 billion, 600 million in November 2008. 2. Stagflation, a time of economic stagnation combined with inflation, can also wreak havoc. This type of inflation is a witch's brew of economic adversity, combining poor economic growth, high unemployment, and severe inflation all in one. Although recorded instances of stagflation are rare, the phenomenon occurred as recently as the 1970s when it gripped the United States and the United Kingdom, much to the dismay of both nations' central banks. 3. 4. Stagflation poses a particularly daunting challenge to central banks because it increases the risks associated with fiscal and monetary policy responses. Whereas central banks can usually raise interest rates to combat high inflation, doing so in a period of stagflation could risk further increasing unemployment. Conversely, central banks are limited in their ability to decrease interest rates in times of stagflation because doing so could cause inflation to rise even further. As such, stagflation acts as a kind of checkmate against central banks, leaving them with no moves left to make. Stagflation is arguably the most difficult type of inflation to manage. Negative inflation. Also known as deflation, negative inflation occurs when prices drop for various reasons. Having a smaller money supply increases the value of money, which in turn decreases prices. A reduction in demand either because there is too large of a supply or a reduction in consumer spending can also cause negative inflation. Deflation may seem like a good thing because it reduces the prices of goods and services, thus making them more affordable. 
but it can negatively affect the economy in the long run. When businesses make less money on their products, they are forced to cut costs, which often means laying off or terminating employees, thereby increasing unemployment. What causes inflation? We can define inflation with relative ease, but the question of what causes inflation is significantly more complex. Although numerous theories exist, arguably the two most influential schools of thought on inflation are those of Keynesian and monetarist economics. Keynesian economists argue inflation results from economic pressures such as the increased cost of production and look to government intervention as a solution. Monetarist economists believe inflation stems from the expansion of the money supply and that central banks should maintain stable growth for the money supply in line with GDP. Keynesian economics. The Keynesian school of thought derived its name and intellectual foundation from British economist John Maynard Keynes, 1883. 1946. 5. Although its modern interpretation continues to evolve, Keynesian economics is broadly characterized by its emphasis on aggregate demand as the prime mover of economic development. As such, adherents of this tradition advocate government intervention through fiscal and monetary policy as a means of achieving desired economic outcomes, such as increasing employment or dampening the volatility of the business cycle. The Keynesian school believes inflation results from economic pressures such as rising costs of production or increases in aggregate demand. Specifically, they distinguish between two broad types of inflation, cost, push inflation, and demand, pull inflation. Cost, push inflation results from general increases in the costs of the factors of production. These factors, which include capital, land, labor, and entrepreneurship, are the necessary inputs required to produce goods and services. When the cost of these factors rise, producers wishing to retain their profit margins must increase the price of their goods and services. When these production costs rise on an economy, wide level, it can lead to increased consumer prices throughout the whole economy, as producers pass on their increased costs to consumers. Consumer prices, in effect, are thus pushed up by production costs. Demand. Pull inflation results from an excess of aggregate demand relative to aggregate supply. For example, consider a popular product where demand for the product outstrips supply. The price of the product would increase. The theory in demand. Pull inflation is if aggregate demand exceeds aggregate supply. Prices will increase economy-wide. Monetarist economics. Monetarism is not explicitly linked to a particular founding figure but is closely associated with the American economist, Milton Friedman, 1912, 2006, 6. As its name suggests, monetarism is concerned principally with the role of money in influencing economic developments. Specifically, it is concerned with the economic effects of changes to the money supply. Adherents of the monetary school are more skeptical than their Keynesian counterparts regarding the effectiveness of government intervention in the economy. Monetarists caution such interventions risk doing more harm than good. Perhaps the most famous such criticism was made by Friedman himself in his influential publication, co-written with Anna J. Schwartz, A Monetary History of the United States, 1867-1960, in which Friedman and Schwartz argued that policy decisions of the Federal Reserve inadvertently deepened the severity of the Great Depression. 7. Based on this skepticism, Friedman suggested central banks should concern themselves with maintaining a stable rate of growth for the nation's money supply in line with the gross domestic product. DIDP 8. Monetarists It's all about the money. Monetarists have historically explained inflation as a consequence of an expanding money supply. The monetarist view is perfectly encapsulated by Friedman's remark that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. According to this view, the principal factor underlying inflation has little to do with things like labor, materials, costs, or consumer demand. Instead, it is all about the supply of money. 9. At the heart of this, perspective is the quantity theory of money, which posits the relationship between the money supply and inflation is governed by the relationship where the money supply, the velocity of money, the average price level, the volume of transactions, misdev, where, methi, money supply, v, velocity of money, p, average, price level, the volume of transactions, 
Implicit in this equation is the belief that if the velocity of money and the volume of transactions is constant, an increase or decrease in the supply of money will cause a corresponding increase or decrease in the average price level. Given that the velocity of money and the volume of transactions are in reality never constant, it follows that this relationship is not as straightforward as it may initially seem. Nevertheless, this equation serves as an effective model of the monetarist belief that the expansion of the money supply is the principal cause of inflation. Nevertheless, the bottom line. Inflation comes in many forms, from historically extreme cases of hyperinflation and stagflation to the 5 cent and 10 cent increases we hardly notice. Economists from the Keynesian and monetarist schools disagree on the root causes of inflation, underscoring the fact that inflation is a far more complex phenomenon than one might initially assume. Why are P-ratios higher when inflation is low? Inflation affects equity prices in several ways. Most importantly, investors are willing to pay less for a certain level of earnings when inflation is high and more for a certain level of earnings when inflation is low and expected to remain so. Key takeaways. Inflation is when the purchasing power of a currency declines over time which has the effect of rising price levels. Companies tend to pass rising costs of production on to their customers, making stocks a pretty good hedge against inflation in general. Investor expectations also are modified by inflation estimates, with higher inflation leading to higher expected returns. When inflation is high, P ratios tend to go down since earnings in the denominator will tend to rise more quickly than the stock price. Review of the P ratio. Let's review the two concepts involved, the price to earnings, P-E ratio, and inflation. The P-A ratio is a valuation measure showing how much investors are willing to pay for a company's earnings. For example, if the price of a stock is $50 and earnings per share is $2, then the P-A-E ratio is $25, $50, $2. This shows that investors are willing to pay 25 times the company's earnings for a share. Inflation is a measure of the rate of price increases in the economy. Exploring the relationship, stable and moderate inflation means a higher probability of continued economic expansion. Modest inflation usually means that the central bank won't be raising interest rates to slow economic growth. When inflation and interest rates are low, there's a greater opportunity for higher real earnings growth, increasing the amount people will pay for a company's earnings. The more people are willing to pay, the higher the pay the higher the pay. When inflation levels are stable and moderate, investors have lower expectations of high market returns. Conversely, expectations rise when inflation is high. When inflation is high, when inflation rises, so do prices in the economy, leading investors to require a higher rate of return to maintain their purchasing power. If investors demand a higher rate of return, the P ratio has to fall. Historically, the lower the P, the higher the return. When you pay a lower pay, you're paying less for more earnings, and as earnings grow, the return you achieve is higher. In periods of low inflation, the return demanded by investors is lower and the P.E. higher. The higher the P.T., the higher the price for earnings, which lowers your expectations of strong returns. During times of low inflation, the quality of earnings is considered to be high. This refers to the amount of earnings that can be attributed to actual growth in the company and not to outside factors like inflation. For example, say inflation is 10 per year, which is high, and the company purchases a widget for $100. In one year, the company will be able to sell that same widget for at least $110 because of inflation. Because its cost for the widget remains $100, it appears to have increased its profit margin, when really the growth is all inflation's doing. In general, investors are more willing to pay a premium or a higher multiple for actual growth compared to artificial growth caused by inflation. Inflation and stock returns. Examining historical returns data during periods of high and low inflation can provide some clarity for investors. Numerous studies have looked at the impact of inflation on stock returns. 1. Unfortunately, these studies have produced conflicting results when several factors are taken into account namely geography and time period. Studies conclude that expected inflation can either positively or negatively impact stocks, depending on the time period, along with an investor's ability to hedge and the government's monetary policy. Two, unexpected inflation showed more conclusive findings, most notably being a strong positive correlation to stock returns during economic contractions, 
demonstrating that the timing of the economic cycle is particularly important for investors gauging the impact on stock returns. 3. This correlation is also thought to stem from the fact that unexpected inflation contains new information about future prices. 4. As such, greater volatility of stock movements has been correlated with higher inflation rates. 5. This has played out as well in emerging markets countries, where the volatility of stocks is greater than in developed markets. 6. When examining SEP 500 returns by decade and adjusting for inflation, the results show that the average annualized returns between 1928 and 2000 were around three and less than the nominal returns. 7. The bottom line. History has shown that investors realize this phenomenon and take inflation into account when valuing stocks. When inflation is high, P ratios are low. When inflation is low, when inflation is low, P ratios are high.